Hello and welcome back to the channel. So you're having trouble playing defense in NHL 24. Well, no problem. I have a video here to help you. In this video, I'm going to teach some of my strategies and my defensive philosophies that have enabled me to go 20-0 in the first two weeks of Hut Champs, and some tips and tricks that will help you become a better player and be able to defend some of the pesky rebounds, deflections, and cross creases. Before I get into this video, I want you to know that defense is more of a philosophy more than your strategies. I have some videos on um, on strategies that are going to help you play defense. Check out my strategy video. But most of the time, it's more of a mindset not really structure, especially in a game where uh, it can be a bit hard to defend some of the high quality chances. So stick around for more of the philosophies behind defense more than the strategies. Also, check me out on Twitch. Uh, I'll be live tomorrow streaming some Hut Champs, trying to go 20-0 again, where you'll be able to see some of my defensive strategies in action. We have some even strength strategies in this video and some penalty kill strategies, and I hope you enjoy. First, let's talk about defensive strategies. If you had watched my video last week on my strategies for NHL 24, you would see that my strategies are vastly different than the ones that I'm going to demonstrate in this video. The reason for that is I believe that these strategies are the simplest defensive strategies for people to use in a good baseline strategy set that people should use before they venture off and try new things. The forecheck is a 1-2-2 passive, which is meant to have one lead forechecker and two people cutting off breakout passes along the boards. And the neutral zone is a 1-4 with one four checker and four people on the defensive line. Have the trap four check at zero, force them to come to you. And then for defensive pressure and defensive strategy, I do protect net and collapsing on the strategy set. The reason this is, is because the simplest way to play defense is to just collapse in the zone and block shots and, and pick off passes. Collapsing is gonna allow you to prevent any entry into the middle and it's gonna force people to shoot from the perimeter. Very skilled players will know how to break through collapsing and that's when, you know, sometimes you'll have to go to tight point for example if you're facing someone who takes a lot of d to d's but a good baseline is protect net and collapsing protect net you're going to collapse they're going to be basically at or below the dots and collapsing they're going to collapse to the slot these two really pair well with each other let's talk about some cycle defense the main goal when defending the cycle is you want to prevent entry into the home plate area the home plate area is the dots down to the goal post up to the top of the circles and they connect, right? So you're trying to prevent shots from here. And this includes deflections. You don't want deflections in there either. I know there are some spots along the boards that create some glitch goals, but other than that, against the average player, you're gonna try and defend shots from this home play area. On this play, I lose the face off and my immediate goal is to prevent entry into the home plate area. He makes a pass up to the point, makes another D to D pass and it's a shot from the outside and it's an easy exit. Although I do turn the puck over now, this play might seem simple, but I'm going to explain to you why all this player got off was a simple wrist shot from the point. He wins the face off and my immediate goal is to prevent entry into the middle for most top players. Their entry into the middle is going to be using their centerman as a bumper. Now using the centerman as a bumper is a smart play because you can go in to out very easy with a pass. So my idea is I'm gonna take away the center, prevent a slot shot, while also taking out a passing outlet. So I switch to Mario Lemieux and my immediate reaction is, okay, he might take a shot for a deflection. He might make a pass. Chances are he's trying to get to this player. So I'm gonna take this away. I go hard at him with Lemieux as my AI apply pressure to the point. Remember I am on collapsing, um, but Ronick decides he's going to go up there because I have moved my center up the ice, which means that the winger is going to move up as well to match the pace of my center. I do the flick ups and I completely take out his center. He is now removed from the play. So as soon as that happens, my next objective is to take away this player. The reason why I want to take away Eichel is because if he gets the puck with a lot of space, he could walk down and cause havoc down low. Reminder, I'm also trying to get the puck back before the full pressure meter fills up. So if this had been last year, I would have left Eichel alone because he's on the outside and it's not much of a threat. This year, I got to be a little bit more proactive with my defense and try and take away any passing lanes available. 
in hopes of stripping the puck before full pressure. So I immediately go to Eichel, but his idea is that he's going to try and spin off of Ronick and come into the middle. I can play both sides here because these two are so close to each other. I can stay on Eichel while also extending my reach with Lemieux. Lemieux is 6'4", he has the reach for it. But I'm also going to stay close enough to Eichel to where if he makes this pass and tries to turn off his back shoulder, I can match speed with him and get to that back post before he does. Also reminder, Eichel is on his backhand here if he gets the puck which is what you should be trying to do. Keep your opponents on their backhand outside of the slot. His center is up. His winger has blown by me. But he, by then, he's decided that his only reasonable passing lane is to his defenseman. My defenseman decides that he's going to try and cover Eichel here. His center, he sure is too high up for a tip to be effective. I apply pressure with McDavid to try and get the poke. It doesn't work. But all he gets is a simple wrist shot from the point with no full pressure meter, and it's no screen either. It might look like McDavid is a screen, but with screens in this game, the player has to be in front of the puck at the time the shot animation happens. So not when the puck's released, but the time of the flick up on the stick, the player or the goalie has to be screened. So this is a clear shot for Koskin, who bats it off to the corner. That's simple defense, take away the middle options, leave everything to the outside, and don't be afraid to just allow point shots to happen because as long as you're on protect net collapsing, chances are you're going to be first to those rebounds anyway. So take away the slot, take away the home plate, allow the outside shots, and you're going to be successful. Defense can seem like a bit of a cat and mouse game sometimes. Sometimes there are players who you go to check and it just seems like they slip off like nothing. And if you don't give them anything, they're just going to rag for the full pressure. This is an instance of that. So my opponent Topher, he decides he's going to just circle around, try and force his way to the middle so he can take a shot. He tries this many times, tries to find many lanes. Doesn't really pass much until he realizes there's not much he can do. He reverse hits me, picks up a different player, gives it to the point, and I block a shot. Now... This might seem just like a bit cat and mousey, but let me explain to you why in this situation, I'm the cat and he's the mouse, and I'm trying to draw him into a situation rather than him trying to draw me into a situation where he can get to the net. In this play, I think of myself as the person pulling the strings here, which might seem weird on defense. Now, let me explain why. Now, because people can rag so easy, you have to kind of give them the impression that there's a lane to be had. On this play, you can see that I purposely do not switch to Adam Foot here. I let Ronick have this lane. This is a clear lane, but I know the moment he takes that lane, I'm going to shoot up with Brooks Orpic and meet him here and try and block him off in a triangle of some sorts. He doesn't take the lane. Instead, he turns back. I shoot down with Foot because I know all he has is I'm going to take away the boards. He's going to turn into the middle. But then I know I can instantly player swap, swap back to Orpic and cut him off here. You have to fake as if there are lanes available and then take them away. Sometimes you have to give people the impression that they're outsmarting you in order to outsmart them later. As you see, he tries to cut in. I poke check. He reverse hits. And then he feels like he has nothing but a pass to the point. To which point I line myself up because I know that there's a deflection opportunity here that I have to block the shot because if he fires it over here and Ronan tips it, it's going in. He takes a shot, it's blocked, and I almost get a breakaway out of it. There was an incidental contact here. I could have, if I would have picked it up on my backhand without going through his stick, it would have been a breakaway. But it was just some incidental contact. I missed the puck. But it does turn into an offensive zone faceoff. So sometimes you've got to play a little bit of a cat and mouse game make them think like they're in control, give them a lane, make yourself appear a bit more dumb than you actually are, and then take advantage of it, bait them, and then destroy them and get the puck back. The full pressure system adds a bit of that cat and mouse element, but if you're smart enough and you have enough intuition that as long as you're taking away the slot passes and the cross creases, that you can afford to do things like this. Just make sure that you're not chasing with multiple defensemen. Make sure that you're chasing with a forward and a defenseman so that you're not draw drawing your defense away from the back post. With 1-2-2 passive, four checking will be a bit harder if you're trying to acquire the puck deep in the offensive zone. But let me explain to you why it's perfect for angling off defenders. Just like in the cycle defense clips, I explained how Opening or allowing yourself to give up lanes in order to block them off later on is a very smart strategy. As you just saw, I took a slap shot with 
Brian Leach and his player is able to kick it back after I board pin him. I leave this lane wide open knowing that I can cut off Victor Hedman here. He's not going to want to make that pass because Victor Hedman's really slow and he has someone with gold wheels. The lane shuts and all he has is a pass up the boards. Now, the smart move would have been to go D to D and over here, but against most players, they're going to take the first option they have out of the zone, and this option was to this player. Now I know that because I'm outnumbering him 4 to 1, basically, in the neutral zone slash offensive zone because he is coming out of the zone, that I can afford to make this step up because if I miss, this player rotates over here, this player rotates over to this guy. So I know that he doesn't have a lot of speed because he just started the breakout, and that was his only option that I can now step up for a hit. I step up for the hit, get the puck, and I immediately try and transition in. So once again, I leave that lane open so that I can bait him into the pass. And knowing that he's on the boards with nowhere to go on the left, I can then come at him on his right shoulder, take him out, and transition back up the ice. Good way to prevent a last minute rush opportunity. This is a bit of a funny play. You can attempt this if you're on a one man four check, really trapping. Diving at passes really works. As long as you get the pass first, it's not a penalty. This is more of a joke clip, but it shows that sometimes diving to pick off passes does work. The biggest part about the forecheck, quite honestly, is recognizing when to step up with your defenseman. Because if you miss a defenseman step up or mistime it, you're going to give up an odd man rush the other way. In this play, I try and circle out in front with McDavid and I lose the puck. He immediately decides he's going to transition up the ice. But he doesn't have anyone going to the boards, and it's going to be a tight pass. Now, also, he's being blocked off by this player, so it's a bad quick breakout to begin with. His players are too bunched up, and they don't have enough speed going through the neutral zone, or through the defensive zone. He's going to make this pass, and I immediately know I'm outnumbering him 3-1, to 4-1 to one if you really look at it from like a, you know, a horizontal line. But at the moment, I know it's at least 3-1. to one. So he's going to make this pass, and I'm immediately recognizing, okay... He's taking it. He doesn't have enough speed. I can step up with Leach because I know that if he, if Matthews can get around me, I have Breeze Ball to meet him. So it's all about recognizing when to step up and knowing that if you step up, you should be outnumbering the attacking team in the location where you step up. Because if you don't, you're going to miss it. And it's going to create odd man rushes. In this case, it's a good step up. I immediately grab the puck and I transition back up the ice. And it leads to a goal, actually. So... You know, this goes for people who are breaking out the puck and for people on the forecheck that if you make a mistake, this leads to extended zone pressure time and it leads to a goal here. It leads to a, a full pressure uh, one time. So honestly, the best thing you can do is just recognize if you're outnumbering someone off the off the forecheck, step up with your defenseman with a hit. And if you are on defense breaking out the puck, if you don't have an option... To make multiple passes off the breakout, regroup. You're not, no one's gonna hate you for resetting to try and find a better lane. I understand people are worried about the puck ragging stigma, but it's a lot better option than just sending a random pass out, getting hit, flattened, and all of a sudden a goal is in the back of your net 30 seconds later because you were in such a rush to get up the ice. First, let's start with some rush defense. The opponent takes the puck and he gives it to his off winger. He goes for a cross crease, recognizes that there's no lane, so he circles back. I take away a couple of the options, he takes a low percentage shot, and I'm able to break the puck back out the other way. First, what I notice immediately as a defending player is off the rush, players like the straight line down the boards. So my job is to immediately turn my body so I'm no longer backskating in order to match the speed of the attacker. I know now that I'm going to be able to match him about right there if we continue on our respective paths. But knowing this, I also have to preemptively predict that he's going to recognize this and he's going to cut into the middle. He cuts into the middle. I maintain my vertical, you know, parallel line with him in order to be able to match any type of movement that he might have. We close in at the line and I recognize, okay, he has two options. He can either let off to his left winger or he can let off to his right winger who's cutting. I take control of Shifley because I know that if he gives it to that off winger, He's straight lining to the net and looking for a cross crease. He gives it off to his left winger, and I immediately know his ideal move would be to straight line past foot and give it to this winger who would crash the net. So I have to stay on Shifley while at the same time recognizing that if 
he decides to cut in the middle, Foot and I can meet him in the middle and crush him. He takes it on the outside, and I recognize, okay, his only option is to this player, because there's three players blocking the trailer pass. There's not a lot of room for him to make a pass like that. So my immediate attention goes to the guy who's going back door. In NHL 24, there are two different types of hits. There are the big hits, where if you're on skill stick, you're going down and up on the right stick, or on total control, you hold in circle. There's also the small hit. If you're on skill stick and total control, you can do the small hits or the bumps by just flicking up on the right stick. In NHL 24, if a, an attacking player comes into the slot, you are allowed to flick hit them when they do not have the puck once or twice. If you do it anymore, you risk getting an interference call and you risk getting a cross-checking call. You can bump them once. I have confirmed with the developer that this is to mimic the intensity of net front battles. So this will not be patched. This is a play that you can use to take away uh, deflections, take away cross creases. Try it. Go and bump a player in your slot once and see how effective it is. He recognizes that there's no cross crease. I bump this player in case the force would have came across. The player was right here, so if he would have tried to force it across, I would have bumped him and the puck would have gone over here. And the moment he turns away, this player is no longer a threat because there's too much of a line. So my next job is to go after the next most dangerous player, which is the trailer, because he can make a pass, go around, and snipe it. In this play, he sure is not dangerous himself because he's not close enough to the goalie in order to take an adequate shot. He's right on the wall, he's on the outside of the circle. Not much chance of a shot here going in. I immediately close the gap on the trailer and my AI remain positioned to take away the cross crease. I keep taking away the trailer, his player goes behind the net and he is forced to take a low percentage shot where he's a lefty on the left side. There's not as many goal line snipes anymore. He takes a low percentage shot, it's a save and I transition up the ice. This is risk management, taking away the cross crease and using a little known tool to take away a high scoring chance. The number one goal that you have when playing defense off the rush is to minimize your opponent's speed through the neutral zone. On this play, my opponent takes the puck and I immediately try and force him to the outside. He runs into my AI and he makes a pass, but the issue is his defenseman has no speed when he's entering the zone, and I'm able to cut him off of the boards and transition up the ice. Now, if we walk through this, we immediately recognize that I outnumber him, in the neutral zone at least, 4-2. to two. He does have two players who can come and offer support, but I have another back checker, so at the very most, I'll outnumber him 5-4. to four. He slows down by stick handling in order to try and prevent me from making a move towards him. He's trying to bait that he's going to cut inside, and I don't allow him to do so. I instead maintain my vertical parallel, and I'm going to try and drive him to the outside. He goes right into my AI, and then he curls around and looks for a pass. His pass goes to Brian Leach. Now, Brian Leach no longer has speed at the blue line, so I can defend him however I want. It's up to him to get by me instead of me having to find a way to contain his speed. So what Brossler does is he goes to the boards because it's the safest place to generate speed. Me, on the other hand, I maintain a close gap to him to force him to make a maneuver once he hits the boards. I want to meet him at the boards and force him to either curl back into this AI or ring it around over here where hopefully my two players can meet his one player and outnumber him down low. I use the flick hits at the boards to bump Brian Leach off the puck and it initiates incidental contact and I'm able to transition the puck up the ice. Again, the biggest thing that you want to do on rush defense is minimize your opponent's speed through the neutral zone, force them into your AI, player switch, get some incidental contact, and that's how you're going to stop the rush. Prevent neutral zone speed. For my penalty kill strats, I use the 1-1-2. One, one, and the reason why is because on the 1-1-2, your forwards are going to rotate with your forwards. So you're going to have one guy pressuring up at the point and one guy in the middle of the ice. He's not really going to play like a center. Treat it like two wingers. They're going to rotate with each other. And on defense, they're going to rotate with each other. The forwards are not going to cover for the defense's mistakes. Defense aren't going to cover for the forwards' mistakes. So this way, you know that if you decide you're going to attack someone with a defenseman, your other defenseman's going to cover, and then the defenseman you attacked with is going to rotate behind. So you can kind of like a like a you know like a cycle. 
you just keep sending one after the other after the other so for me that's a lot better and also protects the middle of the ice from tip shots or slap passes on a box the open or the middle is going to be open there's not going to be someone defending at the net front at least on the one one two you have someone to block that shot defending on the penalty kill can be quite hard and off the rush it can be even worse on this play he gets his own entry and my immediate reaction is to cover the slot he decides to go back to the defense and then d to d and i pick off the pass and i get a breakaway I do not score on the breakaway, but let's look at why this chance happened. So he wins the faceoff, and my immediate reaction is to try and forecheck the defenseman, but he makes a quick pass. I have time to recognize this. Now, my job on the penalty kill is to keep people out of the slot and just understand that you're going to give up a lot of perimeter shots. On this play, my job is to prevent, prevent a pass to the back door and prevent a pass to the trailing man. The reason is... It's because on the power play, most times players are going to force pass it to the middle because they outnumber you. So I don't care about this pass because he's on the blue line. I care more so about blocking off the trailer from a catch and shoot or blocking off the back door. I lock off the trailer because now I know from here that this pass won't work because Hughes is there. I can switch to him and bump the pass here won't work because Hughes can just pick it off. And also, if he spins back around, then I come down with Ronick and cut off the lane there. So, at the moment that he's driven to the outside, I can afford to play a little bit higher because it's going to take him a bit more time to show a pass to this player. And by the time he shows that, I can pick it off. So I immediately know, okay, his only option, if he doesn't reshift his weight back this way, he's going to send the pass up to the defenseman. He sends the puck up back to the defenseman, and now my job is to block this passing lane. The reason is, is because there's not that extra winger to cover this guy. My job now is to recognize Messier has this lane and for me to take away this lane because for him, he can take a rebound shot to that left pad, right? This player's here waiting. He can take a shot and there's a tip opportunity here, tip opportunity here. So my job is to take away this lane and hope that Hughes can take away this guy because they're really close and give Koskinen a free vision line to the puck. However, it's all a facade because... The moment he walks down, I can recognize that he's trying to clear Messier. And the reason why I recognize that is because if he had any aspirations of making this pass in the first place down here, he would have sent it when he was up here because there was more of a lane. So in my mind, I immediately think, oh, he's trying to clear Messier here. That's the only reason why he moved down from the, from the point. So I make the appearance of, hey, I have this lane blocked. You've cleared Messier. But in reality, my momentum's taking me to that defenseman. He tries a D to D pass. And I pick it off. Now, look in the span of three seconds. I start down in the circle. Less than a second and a half later, I'm in a position to take away the D to D, while at the same time being in a position to where if this pass comes through the middle, my player is going to make an attempt to intercept it. All this happens in a second and a half, so it's very fast. But being able to recognize that even the appearance of blocking off a passing lane will force a player to go to a different option leads to mistakes like this. And, and although I don't score on the breakaway, I probably should have. And it's a great A chance nonetheless. So if you have enough breakaways like that, you're going to pot probably 50% of them. So it's all about giving the facade of blocking off passing lanes. Most cases, you should allow the perimeter. But if you find yourself an opponent who's might be a bit too predictable you can faint like you're blocking off the passing lanes and take away the d to d's and look for breakaway chances that's how you defend the pk off the rush defending the penalty kill is all about risk management and understanding your rotations on this play zachary takes in the slot and i'm able to defend the trailer while my ai gets the cross crease he decides to use his thumbs a lot and i decide to make a rotation a poke and knock him off the puck i get the puck out and it's a transition up the other way this was, in reality, a very dangerous opportunity for Zach. Let's break down why this was a dangerous opportunity, and we'll break down exactly how I was able to defend it so well. So I give Zachary the outside track. Now, my goal here is, again, to protect the trailer while also protecting against the, the backdoor play. He goes ahead, way ahead of the rest of his players, which means he only has one option, really. It's to go down this way and allow his trailer to open up behind him. 
I recognize this and understand that he is only dangerous if he gets to the middle of the ice. If he gets into this area, then I have an issue because he's he would have to cut to the net on his backhand. He'd be on his forehand, but he'd have to take a backhand shot. I stay close to the trailer knowing that Orpic has the guy on the back door. Orpic will make an interception on any pass here. I'm going to take the trailer, and this player is going to be able to block off this passing lane. So right now, the least dangerous player on the ice is actually the player with the puck, and that's Jake Sanderson. I run a little interference, and it forces Zach to pass the puck behind the net. Again, I use the flick-up hits in the slot to knock him over, and now he's out of the play. He can't pass to him, so his only option is to try and cut to the middle, which Foot's going to be there for, up to the defense or around the net. He decides to go around the net. Now, Zach has really good thumbs, for those of you who do not know. I play him frequently on the West Coast. He decides he's going to try and nagle his way around me. Now, he has really good thumbs, and I miss a body check, but... For those of you who don't know, when you rotate on defense, especially 1-1-2, which is the defensive structure I use, your forwards will rotate with your other forwards, your defenseman will rotate with your defenseman. So your center is not going to cover the defensive responsibility of the, of the defenseman who got caught out of position. I, Me knowing this, I'm going to switch to Adam Foote in pressure with the stick because now he only has one lane. He can't go through to this player because Messi and Foot are there, so he has to come down here or go up to the point. I'll give him the point all day. I just don't want him getting to the middle. So all he has is over here. He decides to take that lane, and I make a poke check with Adam Foot. and now Orpik is going to swing behind Adam Foot. Now, on the PK, I play my right-hand defenseman on the right side, my left-hand defenseman on the left side. That That's because if they are faced towards the middle, their sticks are now blocking the slot passes as opposed to the back doors. I will manually defend the back doors, I want them to take away the slot passes because there's there's not that fifth forward to take that away in the middle. He tries to scoop by, I hit him, I get the puck, and I transition. So once again, Brooks Orpik is on this side of the ice. He misses. I come at him with foot. Orpik slides in, blocks that off. He has no support. I take it with foot, and I exit the zone. Again, understand your rotations. Understand that you're going to have to give up the perimeter, but also fake lanes, cut them off prevent shots from the home plate, and it'll lead to a lot of success. Structure is more important than just flailing around on defense. I know sometimes you have to survive and not necessarily thrive, but maintain your structure and understand your rotations because on a normal five-on-five -five defense, as soon as I missed the puck with Orpic, my center would have come down and covered for him. In this case, there isn't really a true center, so I now know that Orpic is going to rotate with foot and I can actually go and attack with foot. The penalty kill defense is almost easier than the 5-on-5 five -five defense this year, and a play like this shows why. And there you have it. Some defensive strategies and philosophies that are going to help you keep the puck out of the back of your net in NHL 24. Once again, thank you for watching the video, and I would hope you would leave a like if you liked the video. Also remember to check me out on Twitch at twitch.tv backslash sapster. Tomorrow I'll be streaming Hut Champs once again, and we'll, you'll be able to see some of my defensive philosophies in action, as well as some of my offensive philosophies, of which I will be making a how-to-score video next week. Again, thank you for watching, and have a fantastic day.